Good day, and welcome to this virtual panel on the commemoration of Canada's military efforts since the end of the Korean War. I'm Faith McIntyre, the Director General of Communications with Veterans Affairs Canada, and pleased to be your moderator for today. I would like to begin by acknowledging that the land upon which I am located is unceded Mi'kmaq territory. As we are meeting virtually, I wish to acknowledge the peoples and the lands on which you are each gathered from coast to coast to coast. Avant de commencer, je tiens également à souligner le courage des vétérans des forces armées canadiennes et de la Gendarmerie royale du Canada, qui ont servi et qui continuent de servir aujourd'hui. I would like to ask you to join me in a moment of silence to honor the sacrifices of the many who have fallen in the service of their country. We will now have the pleasure of hearing some opening remarks from the Honorable Lawrence McCauley, Minister of Veterans Affairs and Associate Minister of National Defense. Thank you very much, Faith, and uh, a pleasure to be here. Uh, Lieutenant General Campbell, Lieutenant Colonel Hutt, uh, Sergeant Gauthier. And I wanna thank you and everybody that joined us today. Last November, we talked with historians from the War Museum about how we should remember our post-Korean veterans. It was a great conversation, but what we didn't get what, what it was what the veterans' perspective was. We've all seen movies and documentaries or read books about Canada's long military history. From the trenches of Belgium to the beaches of Normandy, there are stories some stories we know much better than others, but what we know less is not less important. There are hundreds of thousands of veterans out there, hundreds of thousands of veterans with stories worth telling and with stories worth commemorating. Because from the moment someone puts on our uniform, they are part of our military history. Regardless of their rank, how long they've served, or where in the world they, this service took them, their story is our history. As Canadians, it's our duty to recognize and pay tribute to our veterans, including the hundreds of thousands who wore the uniform since the Korean War. There have been women and men, Indigenous people and immigrants who came here in search of a new beginning but decided to give back to their new home. Canadians from all walks of life who serve this country with pride. They all have stories that deserve to be told and Canadians will want to hear. So it's great today to have some veterans with us and to focus on how our modern day veterans feel their service should be recognized. Again, I really appreciate everyone being here, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Again, thank you very much, and back to you, Faith. Thank you very much, Minister McCauley, for being with us today and for your opening remarks. Certainly, this is a very important discussion as we shape the future of commemorations. So indeed, this is Veterans Affairs' latest installment in our new series of virtual panels on the future of commemoration. We would like to thank the Canadian War Museum for their kind support in these outreach initiatives. Depuis de nombreuses décennies, la Première et la Seconde Guerre mondiale, ainsi que la Guerre de Corée, occupent naturellement une place importante dans la mémoire collective des efforts militaires des Canadiens. But the contributions and sacrifices of Canadian service members most definitely did not come to an end after the war years. Our department will be undertaking consultations with veterans and other stakeholders to see how to best ensure that these more recent efforts become better known to all Canadians. Nous ne parlerons aujourd'hui avec trois vétérans des Forces armées canadiennes qui ont servi durant tout un éventail de missions au cours de leur longue carrière afin de savoir comment les contributions et les sacrifices comme les leurs devraient être commémorés et soulignés d'après eux. So let's meet our panelists. 78 years and over 680,000 hours. That is the cumulative service of these three esteemed panelists. 
I am honored to be among them today and to devote a mere 60 minutes of my time to listen and to learn. Lieutenant General, retired Lloyd Campbell, served in the Air Force for 37 years. He was a fighter pilot and went on to hold a variety of senior command and staff positions, including Cold War service in Europe and with the North American Aerospace Defense Command, NORAD, before retiring from the military in 2003 as commander of the Canadian Air Force. Lieutenant Colonel Chris Hutt served in the Canadian Army for 25 years. He was an armored officer with the Royal Canadian Dragoons and took part in missions to Bosnia and Afghanistan, as well as serving in other command and staff positions before completing his military career in 2017. La sergente à la retraite Geneviève Gauthier a servi dans les Forces armées canadiennes pendant 16 ans. Elle était membre du 5e Régiment du génie de combat et a été déployée en Afghanistan où elle était sergente des opérations de son escadron. Plus tôt dans sa carrière, elle a participé à une mission en République centrafricaine. Thank you as well to those who submitted questions for our panelists. We have used the questions and added others to provide for an interesting discussion for our session today. So let's get started. A major goal of a new commemorative approach to honor and recognize newer generations of veterans is to draw parallels between the efforts of Canadians who took part in the great conflicts of the 20th century and those who have served in more recent decades. We just heard a quick snapshot of our panelists' eventful military careers, but we would love to hear more about you and what you all did while you were in uniform. And then perhaps you, should, you could share some reflections on the connections you may see between the service of different era of veterans. Lieutenant General Cam Campbell, we'll start with you. Please tell us a bit more about your military career and your personal thoughts on this question. First, first of all, Bob, Zoom is always to make sure he mutes off, right? Uh, thanks very much, and uh, you know on the introduction, particularly all those years, makes it makes one start to feel a little old uh, there. But uh, I'll try to harken back in my first part here to when I was a much uh, younger guy. Of course, the Cold War was all about deterrence, uh, trying to deter the very large and, uh, and real threat of the Soviet Union at the time, and that meant keeping troops and of Army, Navy, and, and Air Force in Europe that were at a pretty high state of readiness all the time. I got to play my small part of, uh, of that, uh, first of all, at least in 1971, when I was posted to baden Sullingen as a young uh, fighter pilot on CF-104s in the strike attack role. In NATO parlance, strike means uh, nuclear, and so the first part of that was getting combat ready in, in that particular role. Well, we didn't fly with nuclear weapons for obvious uh, reasons. Uh, each of our bases had a, a quick reaction alert area where uh, there would be a certain number of airplanes fully loaded, ready to go 24-7, 365 days a year. And as a young uh, airplane driver, you got the opportunity uh, two or three times a month to uh, actually take command of one of those and spend 24 hours in, in the quick reaction alert, sitting queue, as we called it at the, uh, at the time. Uh, and well, you know, the expectation was uh, that we certainly weren't ever going to be scrambled for real. There was no question about it. It was kind of a foreboding and, and a sobering experience to, uh, to actually sit on alert with uh, such a powerful weapon. Canada got out of that role in 1972, and from there on in, we were in the ground attack role with conventional weapons. So that would be against uh, things like missile sites and airfields and armored concentrations and, uh, and so on. And the missions were all pretty much uh, standard flown at a very low level in pretty marginal weather conditions a lot of times in Europe. Uh, at speeds of uh, 450 knots en route and 540 knots in the target area, that translates to about 1,000 kilometers an hour, which, as you can imagine, then is a, a pretty exciting uh, ride, actually, to be at. And, and, uh, the, the sad part of that, of course, is that the environment was not very forgiving either, and uh, so that mission was not without significant losses, actually, over the uh, the whole period of the 104. 
Uh, I spent a total of 14 years of my career in, uh, in Europe, uh, the last four in the late 80s, early 90s, when it was exciting, but for a different reason, of course. Uh, and that was, uh, you know, the fall of the Berlin Wall, reunification of Germany in 1990, and the dis uh, dissolution of the Warsaw Pact in, in 91. In fact, the whole the whole world over there really turned uh, quite upside down in a way that most uh, didn't think it was uh, ever going to. Uh, and that led to, of course, uh, governments wanting to pick up on the peace dividend and, uh, and of course, cause the... Uh, the Canadian government in this, in this uh, instance to close our remaining two bases in, in Europe, one of which I happened to be commanding at the at the time. And so that sort of marked the end of the Cold War, but as I'm sure my other co-panelists will, uh, will vouch for, uh, unlike this great era of peace and stability that uh, people opined was going to happen at the time, uh, things didn't quite turn out that way, and, uh, and they'll talk about some of the the events that they were involved in. Uh, but we have to remember even today, you know, since 2014, the Canadian government has had uh, forces, land, sea, and air uh, posted on a rotational basis in uh, in Eastern Europe because the, the Russian threat has once more uh, kind of shown up and, and the need to deterrence is, uh, is still there. So it's the, as the old saying goes, you know, plus c'est chance, uh, plus c'est pareil. And uh, yeah. Turning to uh, your question, Faith, about uh, the linkage between uh, the generations of, of veterans, I think, first of all, it's important, as the minister mentioned, to, to just talk about what an immense contribution and sacrifice was made by those who participated in the First World War. Over 620,000 Canadians served 60,000 combat deaths. Second World War, we uh, were talking over a million and uh, 45,000 deaths. A lot of those were, were uh, airmen, by the way, in the bombing ops. And the population at that time was, uh, was under 12 million people. So just about everybody in Canada either was involved themselves in, uh, in the war or they were part of a family that uh, was involved in the war. So, so I think there was a, there was a real understanding that existed. And my own father served overseas uh, in the Royal Canadian Air Force for three years uh, during that time. Um, and while I was born after the war, when he got uh, home, uh, I ended up being named after two of his squadron mates that were uh, killed in operations in Europe. And so I've uh, sort of had this uh, personal uh, reminder of their sacrifices uh, for, for all of my life and my career as well. Um, I mentioned earlier my own experience w at the pointy end, at least, was uh, was Cold War. But as a commander later, I did get the opportunity to oversee things uh, surrounding Bosnia and the Kosovo air campaign, the uh, response to 9-11, the uh, terrorist attacks, and, and then the start of the Afghanistan conflict as well. And, I mention that only because it gave me a great opportunity as a leader to look at those who were at the front end at that time, people like uh, like Chris and like Genevieve, who, uh, who demonstrated the same kind of, uh, of uh, perseverance and dedication to duty and, and uh, you know, made me uh, very, very proud as a leader, I must say, to, uh, to see their this generation of uh, now veterans, but uh, then frontliners uh, in action, uh, believe me. So to answer the, the question, uh, my own sense is that there's a, there's a really strong and common bond that uh, ties all of us to, together. You know, we've all had to show perseverance and dedication to duty. We all have, uh, have had to, to uh, experience losses in, uh, in the service of our country. And so it, I think that, uh, as I said, this bond between veterans past, present, and future is something that's uh, indelibly stamped in our DNA and it's gonna preserve and stay for a long, long time. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Lieutenant General Campbell. And certainly, I would hesitate to say you actually played a big part um, in, in the front, so to speak, on so many occasions and across so many uh, missions. Uh, and I would also uh, note that you did so throughout some very critical moments in history. I think it'll be interesting to see uh, how your colleagues respond to this question. So with that, then, I'll turn to Lieutenant uh, Colonel Hutt. You served in both Bosnia and Afghanistan. So tell us a little bit about your career and what sense do you get from your comrades? Do you think there is a hesitancy to consider yourselves as much as a veteran as those who may have fought 75 or 100 years ago? Thanks for that. Um, so I enrolled in 1992, so it was in the wake of the Cold War and right at the beginning of what I would say is an increased operational tempo um, for the peace support operations. So after I enrolled, we sent forces over to Rwanda, Somalia, and the Balkans, the opening, opening days of the Balkans. Um, I showed up in Petawawa as a qualified armored officer in, in uh, 1996, and I was put in charge as, as a 23-year-old of uh, 16 soldiers, of which I was the third youngest. And most of them had outstripped me in, in age and experience quite significantly and uh, in charge of four armored cars. And within nine months of showing up in Petawawa, I was a part of a major column that deployed from Petawawa and around the north shore of the Great Lakes to relieve uh, Winnipeg during the Red River floods of 97. A year after that, I was deployed, or sorry, even less than a year after that, another nine months after that, I was deployed to Bosnia uh, for the first time in, uh, in charge of 28 soldiers. Uh, including reservists and uh, some of the first females within the combat arms and in charge of seven armored cars and deployed into a peace support operation there. Um, over the years, I spent uh, my career kept on going and I spent the majority of my time in the field force uh, following a similar routine where I was either training for and deploying on operations or directly training people to go on operations themselves. Um, committed to that. I would have to say that over that time and in the earlier years, um, there was a reluctance uh, to acknowledge people of our generations uh, as veterans ourselves. We didn't think of ourselves that way. Um, it's a failing, I think, of people in the CAF that because we're around extraordinary people doing extraordinary things, to us it seems normal. Um, and it's only in retrospect when you get a bit of distance from it, you start to realize uh, some of the extraordinary things that you did and the extraordinary people you had the opportunity to serve with. Uh, so. One of the things that I would say is the linkage was always there, as, as uh, General Campbell pointed out. Um, I learned my craft and everything I know about leadership from NCOs and officers that served during the Cold War. And uh, they taught me uh, my, my job and, and what it was to be a leader. And they, in turn, had learned that from the Korean War vets and the World War II vets. And those linkages were even alive for people of my generation. Uh, there's a trooper retired, Don Wood, who is a driver of the 2nd Armored Car into Lee Warden on April 15th in 1945. And uh, we host them every year in Petawawa, my, my old unit, the Royal Canadian Dragoons. He shows up in recognition of that date, the liberation of Lee Warden, and tells stories and shares his experiences with us. Um, while uh, I was a lieutenant and a young captain, uh, Brigadier General retired Radley Walters, who's Canada's tank ace, uh, who'd fought his way through Normandy and the Falaise Gap and all the way through the Northwest Campaign. Um, and received honors from the Queen, uh, lived just outside of Petawawa, and we would host him for prof professional development. And again, he would share his stories about tactics and leadership uh, and his experiences from the war. So those linkages were very alive. As I know in the Army, and I'm sure it's the same with the Air Force and the Navy, um, where we have those linkages. And it's hard to put yourself in the same standing, if you will, as a veteran when you're experiencing the stories of those people. I would say that actually started to change um, on the eve of Afghanistan and during the campaigns in Afghanistan, because all of a sudden it became very evident that not only um, with regards to the peace support operations in the Cold War, um, that we were actually fighting in combat. And that that reluctance to recognize yourself as a veteran and to recognize your peers and your brothers and brothers and sisters in arms as veterans sort of dissipated, if you will, and that reluctance sort of uh, went away. Um, and I think, again, while you're still serving, you, you don't think of it as a big deal um, because it's just your job. 
and it's what everyone around you is doing. And so it, it's it, the typical approach of a soldier is to treat it as sort of blase, even though you're doing something really cool. Um, but with regards to as you take that step away, um, I think that that reluctance to call yourself a veteran and recognize that you are in fact a veteran uh, has gone gone away, and that most of us do um, once we do step away and begin our life after service uh, feel that we are veterans. Lieutenant Colonel Hutt, thank you very much. And certainly it, it's akin to the common bond that we heard from uh, Lieutenant General uh, Campbell and those linkages that uh, that you mentioned and uh, appreciated the, uh, the the firsthand stories of how you kept sort of all those pieces alive and continuing throughout history. I think that's critical. Um, Geneviève, uh, la Sergent Gauthier, uh, nous aimerions uh, maintenant que vous nous racontiez certaines de vos expériences. Uh, on a entendu de vos collègues plus ça change, plus séparé. Uh, D'après vous et vos collègues de l'Afghanistan, quels sont vos points communs avec ceux qui ont combattu pendant les guerres mondiales? Bonjour. Euh, Je suis bien heureuse aujourd'hui de participer à cette euh, table ronde. C'est très important pour moi de, de pouvoir parler de nos histoires, de notre, notre carrière, pour que les gens sachent exactement ce qu'on a vécu. Euh, C'est pratiquement thérapeutique pour nous, les vétérans, de pouvoir raconter nos histoires. Ça fait du bien. pour euh, Moi-même, qui ai été diagnostiqué il n'y a pas longtemps avec le syndrome post-traumatique, j'ai dû... Euh, J'ai dû faire mes recherches et mes pour participer à cette table ronde. J'ai dû m'asseoir, penser à ma carrière, me rappeler les merveilleux souvenirs, les merveilleuses choses que j'ai faites. Donc, c'est une très belle opportunité aujourd'hui de pouvoir participer à cette table ronde. Pour parler de ma carrière, je me suis enrôlée dans les années 90. J'étais dans les premières femmes dans les armes de combat. Euh, à ce moment-là, c'était plus... Euh, on avait plus un rôle de gardien de la paix dans les forces armées canadiennes, donc notre entraînement allait vers le maintien de la paix. Euh, on s'est entraîné avec les mines, les, c'était plus les, 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 euh, presque encore la guerre froide, comme euh, mes collègues disaient. Euh, mais vers les années, plus qu'on est allé vers les années 2000, l'équipement, tout a changé. On s'est allé vers un, un milieu plus de guerre et de bataille. Et euh, l'entraînement est devenu de plus en plus intensif. Euh, on s'est entraîné pendant des années ensemble euh, pour pouvoir aller en Afghanistan. C'était notre but. Donc, euh, quand je suis allée en Afghanistan en 2007-2008, ça a été une très belle aventure. Difficile, très difficile aussi, parce qu'on a perdu plusieurs personnes. On a fait des cérémonies de la rampe. Euh, où ce que c'est le cercueil transporté par des, des gens qu'on connaît qui, qui rentrent dans l'avion puis qui retournent à la maison. Ça a été complètement différent de tout ce qu'on pouvait s'attendre. Euh, on pense qu'on est prêt pour la, la guerre ou pour la bataille, mais c'est quand on arrive dedans puis qu'on le vit à tous les jours qu'on se rend compte que c'est pas... On n'est jamais assez prêt. Mais on a vécu... Des choses incroyables aussi avec des gens. Euh, on a touché des gens en Afghanistan. Je me souviens d'une petite fille qui venait me voir euh, tous les jours et je lui donnais des bonbons. Et un jour, euh, elle a réalisé, elle a dit à mon interprète, euh, elle est comme ma mère. Elle s'était jamais rendue compte que j'étais une femme. Et tous les jours, j'allais lui donner des bonbons. Euh, je crois qu'on a touché des cœurs, on a touché des gens. Euh, ce qu'on a fait, on l'a fait avec passion. Les... Pour mettre un rapprochement avec les soldats d'avant et d'aujourd'hui, c'est ça, je dirais, c'est nos soldats, on a, on a cette même passion, c'est une vocation. On n'est pas, il euh, y a une chanson célèbre qui dit on ne fait pas pour l'argent ou on, on le fait parce que c'est ce que notre cœur veut faire. Et euh, c'est pour ça qu'on s'entraîne si fort, qu'on est prêt à faire des sacrifices avec nos familles. Euh, pendant toutes nos années d'entraînement, où ce qu'on est toujours parti, il y a des années où j'étais plus parti quand je n'étais pas en mission. J'étais toujours sur un cours en exercice, euh, sur mon cours de sergent, sur mon cours de VBL3, euh, de, che de chef d'équipage. Euh, il y a des... 
C'est tout un sacrifice qu'on a fait, mais c'est parce que c'est notre passion. Autant que euh, les, les médecins, les gens sur les premières lignes dans les hôpitaux aujourd'hui avec le, le COVID, eux, c'est leur, leur grand sacrifice, mais nous, c'était notre vocation aussi. C'est ce qu'on a voulu faire. Donc, je crois qu'il y a vraiment un rapprochement. La guerre était différente. Oui, on ne parle plus de guerre de tranchées. C'est plus une guerre urbaine ou avec des, des bombes artisanales, des choses comme ça. Mais la passion, le professionnalisme des soldats, euh, pour moi, c est, c est, ça fait partie de, ce, de nous, de ce qu'on voulait faire et euh, on est bien fiers de ça. Oui, on se considère, moi, je me considère comme vétéran. Euh, quand quelqu'un me dit merci pour votre service, souvent je deviens un petit peu, euh, un petit peu mal à l'aise, mais je vais vous dire que je me colle les talons un petit peu et que le dos me vient droit et ça me rend heureuse. Et ça fait du bien. Beaucoup de, de nous, vétérans à la maison aujourd'hui, comme moi, je suis très loin de tout ce qui est militaire. Ça fait dix ans que je suis partie. Euh, J'ai plus accès à tout. Mes, mes, mes anciens collègues, les, les cérémonies, ces choses-là. Mais quand euh, des cérémonies comme le jour du souvenir et les gens viennent me remercier, ça me fait vraiment du bien. Je pense que c'est une partie de la guérison euh, pour nous, euh, les soldats, c'est d'être reconnus pour notre sacrifice et ce qu'on a fait. C'est tout. Merci beaucoup, Sergent Gauthier. Et vous devriez certainement être fier. Vous avez le droit d'être fier. Et aussi, on apprécie énormément euh, que vous nous racontiez votre histoire. Puis on ressent que ça, fait vraiment du fond, euh, ça vient vraiment du fond de votre cœur. Vous aviez aussi parlé du maintien de la paix. Puis c'est vraiment le maintien de la paix qui vient à l'esprit de bien des gens lorsqu'il pense aux efforts militaires du Canada depuis 70 ans, sans compter l'Afghanistan. So, Lieutenant Colonel Hutt, you've taken part in peace support efforts. What do you think Canadians need to know about these kinds of missions, especially in exceptionally challenging places like the Balkans in the 1990s, and how do you think they should be commemorated and recognized? Um, thank you. So as I mentioned, I went to Bosnia for the first time as a young troop leader um, with an armored reconnaissance squadron in 1998. So it was two years after the Dayton Accords had been signed. And, uh, th and I had the opportunity to go back again in 2003-2004, uh, uh, nine years after the Dayton Accords were signed. And it was I saw a great deal of progress, but I, I want to backtrack a little bit, just kind of put this in the context of the Bosnian picture. So in that first troop that I deployed with, were soldiers that had been part of the unperformed missions that were there under the UN mandate uh, when the shooting was actually going on and the war was fully raging. Um, there were also soldiers that had been there during uh, the first, what is referred to as I-4, which was the mission that went in to enforce the Dayton Accords and actually impose peace, um, which included actually firing um, you know, missiles at forces that weren't observing the ceasefire provisions. And some of them had been on both missions. And then we were about to deploy in, in 1998 as what was called S4, which was Stabilization Force, which was the ongoing maintenance of the, of the Dayton Accords and to continue to monitoring the situation. But in reality, had the appearances of being a very stable um, uh, and permissive environment. Uh, but the thing is, is each one of those realities of those tours was very, very different. And, but at the same time, is they all had their challenges, and they all had their risks, and uh, at any point on the turn of a dime, they could change. And I'm gonna throw out some, some anecdotes and some things to think about with regards to what I think people need to be aware of, because I think that there's a misperception um, or a bit of a myth about what peace support operations actually were um, within the Canadian public. Uh, and there's that vision that it is a UN mandate, permissive environment, uh, minimal threat, and that everyone will be safe. And in reality, it is far from that. Um, that could be 90% of a tour, but there will be days where things are terrible and that there are very real threats. In 1993-94, under the UN mandate, uh, Canada took part in the largest single combat action between the Korean War and when we actually did the, the uh, Battle of Panjway in uh, 
Operation Medusa in Afghanistan. And that was the Medak pocket, where there was a battalion that fought off an offensive um, from Croatian forces and actually was in combat action. And very few people in Canada are actually aware that occurred because it wasn't talked about. Later on in that same role, uh, uh, not, not that exact same mission, but later on in that same era during the war years, members of my regiment were actually forcibly detained by the Serb army uh, for a period of two to three weeks. And uh, they were held as hostages by the Serbian army in order to prevent the UN forces and NATO forces from uh, uh, interfering with their operations. Um, and again, something that's not talked about or not known widely in the public. Um, in my own tour, uh, when I went there, it was largely a very permissive environment. Um, the, the ceasefire was well in place and we were in a monitoring role. Uh, most of my time was spent doing what was called framework operations, which basically visibility patrols and just keeping, watching the atmospherics and monitoring things going on. And we drove through areas that had been ethnically cleansed, uh, where there was honest to God ghost towns, where everybody that used to live in these little villages was dead and buried somewhere in, in that local area. And if you actually took the time to look through windows, you'd see where there are dinner places that had still been set from two years before when the village got cleaned, uh, or ethnically cleansed, I should, should say. Um, so tents, and there was a mine threat and things we dealt with. But even in that permissive environment, in the course of one day, the entire tour changed. Because one of the towns uh, where there was a Canadian contingent was located, uh, a group of Croatian, Croatian paramilitaries and, uh, and uh, ethnic Croats living, living in Bosnia decided that they were going to attempt to ethnically cleanse the Serbs that had been returning to the town. And they started to burn houses, uh, burn the people out, and were attempting to actually round them up to, to actually murder them. And it was only intervention of the Canadian forces that were located there intervening uh, to the point where uh, there was warning shots fired and there was an escalation of force and it actually almost turned into arm, armed combat. And it was very a very close thing uh, that we all became engaged in, that we actually saved the Serbian locals that were in there that were about to be ethnically cleansed. And that was in 1998, two years after the war. So, and I, and I guess the last anecdote I'll share is that in 2003, 2004, again, the dynamic of the tour changed. Again, the, the, the peace accords were, were still largely in place. Uh, our focus had changed, and we were actually following a lot through uh, monitoring organized crime networks who were dealing in everything from weapons uh, to human trafficking rings. And there were instances where our neighboring contingents were finding uh, dungeons of people that were being held against their will and moved into basic slavery for all intents and purposes. But at the same time, we were still finding the weapons of war that were actually being squirreled away and cached, ready for when we all turned away and for the war to start again. Um, we were finding everything from small arms to one day in a factory behind a false wall, two howitzers were discovered uh, by the British contingent that were actually not just relics of the war, they were actively being maintained by someone. And there was maintenance logs being kept with it. So a very different reality and very different challenges. And, and at any moment that situation could have changed. So I think what people need to realize about peace support operations were is, is that, that that myth or maybe that rosy colored view that people have of it isn't necessarily the reality. And I think the way to recognize what people did on these peace support operations, be it Rwanda, Somalia, the Balkans, uh, East Timor, any number of the places that we were, is that they need to recognize the realities of it. Um, I, I call it the good, the bad, and the ugly, because a lot of good was done. Um, a lot of our folks were put in risk um, and put in harm's way. And sometimes there were failures. Uh, it was mentioned earlier that there was a peace dividend. Um, I would say that we never, we never saw that at the end of the Cold War, because if anything, the operational tempo went up. Very different than what is in the Cold War, but the operational tempo went up. But at the same time, because there was the perception that there was a peace dividend and these were peace support operations, that they didn't need to be equipped um, quite as well. And that they didn't need to be invested in. So there was a bit that there there was a bit of a, an illusion there. So I think people need to be aware of that. The the realities of what peace support actually was, um, it is, and, and the fact that it is uh, not safe, and that there are risks, and that even though it is a quote unquote peace support operation, very quickly it can turn into combat, and people within the forces have to be prepared for that, and everybody has to be aware of that. Thanks.
Well, say no. Thank you very much for that. And uh, in really sharing the realities of the experiences of peacekeeping, which I think is an important part of the discussion in terms of the way forward for commemoration, while also important in educating uh, all Canadians on the picture uh, of what took place and what existed, uh, as well as the examples in other areas that the Canadian Armed Forces were engaged uh, over a number of years. And certainly, um, as we look towards Sergeant Gauthier, maintenant, pour appuyer un peu de la question, c'est certain qu'on veut se pencher sur une nouvelle approche qui vise à commémorer les efforts déployés par les forces armées canadiennes à l'étranger, un peu comme a uh, décrit uh, ton collègue uh, il y a juste une minute. L'idée serait possiblement d'avoir des années thématiques axées sur les missions menées dans différentes parties du monde. Uh, vous étiez un vétéran, vous êtes une vétéran, je devrais dire, vous étiez en mission en Afrique et en Afghanistan. Donc, qu'en pensez-vous? Je trouve que c'est vraiment une bonne idée. On a besoin de dire nos histoires, on a besoin d'être commémoré, comme je disais plus tôt, euh, d'être reconnu pour ce qu'on a fait. C'est une partie de notre guérison comme soldat, comme, euh, comme vétéran. Euh, mes enfants, mes jeunes enfants, ça n'ont aucune idée qu'est-ce que j'ai pu faire dans les forces armées canadiennes. Une journée, je suis allée à une cérémonie du souvenir avec eux et j'ai mis mon béret, mon chapeau. Et mes enfants m'ont dit, maman, t'as donc bien un drôle de chapeau. Ils, ils ne connaissent pas. Donc, on doit commémorer, ça va apporter euh, des connaissances pour les jeunes. Donc, il ne faut pas oublier ce qu'on a fait. Comme je dis, on, on, on parle toujours de la deuxième, deuxième guerre, première guerre, mais nos soldats, ce qu'on a fait, notre contribution est aussi important. C'est une différente guerre, mais c'est aussi important. Euh, un autre exemple, quand j'étais avec les enfants, quand je suis allée pour la, la cérémonie du souvenir avec mes, mes enfants, euh, je suis allée dans les classes et... Euh, les enfants pouvaient me poser des questions. Euh, J'ai un enfant qui m'a demandé si j'avais servi avec son grand-père euh, durant la Deuxième Guerre mondiale. Et un autre enfant m'a demandé, « Mais est-ce que tu aimes la guerre? » Donc, les questions étaient tellement merveilleuses et c'était tellement touchant de pouvoir discuter avec les enfants. Et euh, la question de la guerre, ça m'a vraiment surpris. J'ai dû m'asseoir une seconde et penser... Et la façon que j'ai expliqué ça à l'enfant, c'est nous, militaires, on est un peu comme les pompiers ou les policiers. On peut demander à un policier s'il aime les bandits. Il probablement n'aime pas les bandits, mais il aime, il aime le maintien de, de, de l'ordre. Le pompier, il n'aime pas nécessairement le feu, mais il, il fait sa, son travail pour éteindre le feu. Mais un soldat, c'est un peu la même chose. On est tous des, des parents. Euh, des conjoints, euh, des frères, des sœurs, des oncles, des tantes, et on a tous ces gens-là derrière nous, et on fait ça pour eux. C'est notre travail. La commémoration avec euh, des, des parades ou des, des... ça va aider beaucoup à comprendre ce qu'on a fait et un peu euh, enlever le, le, le stigma que les, les vétérans, on est chez nous, on est, on, on est euh... On n'est pas de bonne humeur, on ne veut pas voir personne. Ou de mettre nos vétérans dans la communauté, je crois, où ça, va, ça va aider beaucoup, beaucoup. Ça pourrait avoir des effets très bénéfiques sur nous, les vétérans, pour, et aussi sur, sur nos enfants pour ne pas qu'ils perdent ces connaissances-là. Merci euh, beaucoup, euh, Sergent Chenbiev. Euh, pardon, Sergent Gauthier, là. <rire> je, je vois certainement que l'importance d'avoir de, des exemples concrets, euh, d'avoir les expériences réelles que vous nous parlez d'aujourd'hui euh, tous les trois, puis d'être capable de répondre des fois à des questions difficiles, mais les questions aident aussi à, à l'apprentissage, puis à la connaissance, puis commémoration de tout euh, ce que vous avez vécu vous autres et vos collègues. So, Lieutenant General Campbell, uh, we have spoken and your colleagues have referenced the Cold War. You are a veteran of the Cold War. This struggle was a top priority for the Canadian military from the early 1950s to the early 90s. Uh, 
but the public is perhaps not as aware of it as they are of our peacekeeping missions. Both regular forces and reservists also perform many important roles here in Canada, and we've heard some of those described as well by your colleagues, from standard duties like patrolling our frontiers, search and rescue, to helping out during national disasters. So what should Canada do to better recognize our country's Cold War contributions? And how do you think other types of efforts can best be recognized? Thank you, Faith. Uh, let me let me start first of all by echoing uh, something that uh, Geneviève talked about, and that's uh, the the importance of educating our youth. And uh, you know, it, it reminds me of a of a a thing that just recently came to my mind to to my attention, and and that's a school project that a school in Toronto, North York, actually did. Uh, uh, it's an oral history program where they interviewed dozens and dozens of, uh, of uh, veterans and serving uh, individuals in the armed forces today uh, in person and via Zoom and so on. And th these, these are really quite uh, fascinating uh, stories that, uh, that they were allowed to, to, to tell. And, and the, uh, I think the thing about that is that this is really students educating themselves about uh, about the war and, and about all, all of the past conflicts that people have been involved in, including m very modern ones. Uh, and I think that's something that we really need to encourage. Uh, when it comes to uh, memorials, I mean, it's hard to say. There are a lot of memorials uh, around uh, to the Cold War. I'm thinking of things like the Canadian War Museum, the uh, Canada Air and Space Museum, the Cold War Museum out in uh, Calgary. There are museums on just about every one of our bases and uh, and wings around the country that are open to the public and these things are extremely important to to at least show in um, in terms of equipment and uh, and artifacts and so on really what's uh, what's going on as the minister said you know there were a lot of people involved in this uh, in this program that we call the cold war you know over a hundred thousand uh, served in germany over the uh, the years not counting families obviously uh, hundreds of thousands more served back here in Canada, and as uh, as you mentioned in your question, you know those regular forces. We had reservists. People are involved in uh, in not only defending our borders and our airspace, but uh, carrying out search and, and rescue missions and so on. And I can tell you from my experience with search and rescue uh, people, you never get to do a search and rescue mission in nice weather in the broad light of day. Search and rescues always seem to happen at nighttime and in, in, in the very poor weather conditions. And uh, they've been costly in terms of lives over the years as, uh, as well, we can sadly, uh, sadly say. And, you know, while they often, uh, often say that the Cold War wasn't a shooting war, like uh, some others have been, nevertheless, uh, about 1,700 Canadians lost their lives in training and, uh, and operations during that period. So it's not a small... Uh, cost in, in human lives. I think in terms of remembrance, so one of the most important things that I've seen happen has already happened, and that was the creation of the seventh book of remembrance. For those who uh, don't know or may not uh, recall much about the books of remembrance, uh, there were originally were three, um, essentially, uh, First World War, well, uh, sorry, six, but they incl included three campaigns, the First World War and Second World War in Korea. Um, that was kind of a sad event in my view and uh, in the view of many others and fortunately through a lot of diligence and some effort on myself by myself when i was commanding the air force we managed to get approval to have what was called the seventh book of remembrance and that book now uh, has the names of some 1961 canadians who died in operations like in afghanistan in the cold war in peacekeeping operations and so on these are uh, these books are kept on uh, on Parliament Hill, normally in the memorial chamber of the Peace Tower. But right now, they're because of the construction ongoing. They're uh, they're contained uh, at the visiting center. But but they're also online through Veterans Affairs Canada. And I really encourage uh, all of us, you know, to take the time once in a while and just check in and look at them because you can look up anybody who's a friend or uh, a, a relative that you lost. Uh, and to see how their name is engraved in the book. 
for uh, for memory for, for forever. So I think that's a, a very important uh, important thing. Um, the other way, though, that we need to, uh, as Canadians, I think, uh, remember our veterans is by looking after them. Um, Genevieve mentioned her own challenges uh, with PTSD. Uh, she's obviously not uh, alone. I have a nephew uh, who was also a combat engineer that suffers uh, the same way. Um, and there, are, you know, when we when we look at that, we really need to to start like, uh, looking after people. Well, I keep looking after. I, I don't want to make this sound like nothing is happening. In fact, uh, I'm on the board of the Pearly and Rideau Veterans Health Center here in Ottawa, which has a lot of, uh, was originally a lot of uh, Cold War veterans, sorry, uh, for, uh, Second World War veterans. That number sadly is diminishing, but uh, the government, uh, Veterans Affairs, uh, recently started a, a, a pilot project. So we have 60 of our rooms are now dedicated to what are called uh, other qualified veterans. These are mostly Cold War. Some perhaps might have come after that, but mostly Cold War. People on a disability pension who need the kinds of services that long-term care provides. And uh, it's been a very successful program and we're very uh, keen to see it become reality, not just a, not just a pilot, and, uh, and expand its way across uh, the country and even in larger size. Uh, along the same vein, and this one more uh, more aimed at, uh, I would say, people of, uh, of uh, Chris's and Genevieve's uh, era, is uh, the creation of a, a, a 40 apartment uh, block here in Ottawa called Veterans House, which was uh, funded through largely charitable con contributions, the multi-faith uh, housing initiative. Uh, and uh, the City of Ottawa Veterans Affairs played a role, the Legion and, and others as well. And that will take 40, it'll be full by the end of this uh, month, they tell me, but uh, it'll, it'll provide uh, fully equipped apartments for what hitherto would have been 40 homeless veterans. And so those are the kinds of programs, I think, that really in a very concrete and tangible way commemorate the service of, uh, of our people. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lieutenant General Campbell, and, and many really concrete examples of, of what commemoration means and, and how you see that uh, from the educating of, of youth on the good, the bad, and the ugly, as your colleagues said, uh, to the importance of capturing the moments in the books of remembrance, which, as you noted, are available to uh, viewers on our Veterans Affairs Canada website as an initial place to go find out more about them. And interesting, too, how you frame the importance of supports as being a way in which commemoration is critical and we have to continue to do so. Um, I'd like to speak a bit more in terms of Afghanistan. And we heard that, you know, Afghanistan was really a bit of a turning point um, in the various uh, missions and, and what had taken place uh, after, if you will, the more traditional war era. era. Donc, uh, Sergeant Gauthier, vous étiez parmi les plus de 40 000 membres des Forces armées canadiennes qui ont servi en Afghanistan. Cette mission a considérablement sensibilisé le public à nos réalisations militaires et aux sacrifices consentis. Et ceci incluait la force régulière et des réservistes. La construction de nouveaux monuments nationaux en est en honneur des efforts déployés pour notre pays en Afghanistan est prévu pour 2024. Qu'en pensez-vous? Et de quelle autre façon croyez-vous que ces efforts devraient être commémorés? Not only for the force regular, but also for the reservists. I love the idea of having a monument to commemorate Afghanistan specifically. Uh, we had a very beautiful monument in Kandahar, which was just à côté de mon bureau où j'allais me recueillir souvent quand j'avais une journée difficile ou quand si quand j'étais sur le camp à Kandahar avec la photo de toutes nos disparus avec une petite description. Euh, ce monument-là est maintenant à Ottawa. Je suis vraiment heureuse de savoir qu'il a été mis, euh, qu'il est disponible pour aller le voir. Mais euh, non, je crois que c'est important. En ayant un monument, même pour nous vétérans, de pouvoir aller se recueillir, euh, je ferai un voyage spécial pour Ottawa où va être le, le, le monument, c'est certain. Même celui présentement qui est à de Kandahar, j'aimerais ça aller le voir, ça fait partie de, de, de mes projets. Euh, mais en, 
justement, pour se recueillir. Ça, va, ça fait partie, encore une fois, de la, reconnu, la, re, la reconnaissance et de, et de la guérison pour nous. Je parle beaucoup de guérison, mais c'est vraiment... On perd beaucoup trop. Encore aujourd'hui, il euh, y, y a une semaine, j'ai vu des photos passer dans mon fil d'actualité où un ami à moi, très proche, a perdu sa bataille contre le, contre le syndrome post-traumatique. Et euh, à chaque année, les photos reviennent, on s'ennuie. Euh, C'est important pour nous. La, recon la, reconnaissance, la reconnaissance pour ce qu'on a fait... Euh, est une partie vraiment importante, je crois, et des monuments sont la, le meilleur exemple, la meilleure chose qui peut se passer avec ça. Merci beaucoup, Sergent Gauthier. Donc, certainement plusieurs façons de reconnaître le service et les vétérans, mais comme que vous aviez indiqué, l'aspect physique d'avoir un monument euh, est un, un de ces aspects qui aide non seulement avec euh, l'aspect de la touche, d'être capable de voir, de toucher quelque chose, mais aussi l'aspect, comme tu as dit, de la guérison complète au, de l'individu éventuellement espérant. I know that our time is, is certainly moving forward quite quickly this afternoon, so I would like to ask a, a last question to uh, Lieutenant Colonel Hutt. And you've all spoken about the your families in some way, shape, or form, and I know that we've really only touched the tip of the iceberg on how your families have been engaged and supported you, and how commemoration certainly uh, would be seen to be an important part for them. So, um, Lieutenant Colonel Hutt, you know, we know that people with a connection to military community remark how you could not do what you did without the support and sacrifice from your families. Uh, we know that, um, you know, I, I know you personally, you, you have a wife and uh, you have twin daughters who take up a lot of your time. Um, though certainly during your service, uh, how did that impact them? And how do you think that kind of sacrifice could be recognized on the part of families? Thanks for that, Faith. Um, it, it does. It, it, it actually, they, family is a big thing within the military because without the foundation of family, we couldn't do what we need to do. Um, and they, they give up a lot. And there's operations is one piece. And I'll give a personal anecdote. Um, so my future wife moved with me to Petawawa during one of my postings, away from all of her friends and family, um, in a completely new environment. Uh, nine months later, I deployed for seven months and left her there. Um, she, she stayed with me and we, we ended up getting married. But again, that, that, that was asking a lot um, to live in a strange place away from all her friends and family and her network of support while I went away. Uh, that was my first, or sorry, that was my second deployment to Bosnia. A few years later, uh, before having kids, I was actually given the good news and the bad news. The good news was I was promoted to major. The bad news was I was deploying in less than 30 days to Afghanistan. When I went home to tell my wife, she looked at our unfinished kitchen in the house that we were in the midst of building and uh, gave me a dirty look and walked into the bedroom. But then after that, she set up basically how she could support me and, and, and how I could support her. And, and then I deployed 30 days later and was gone for seven months again to Afghanistan. Um, and she is one of the strongest people I've ever met. And she did that. And she did that to support me um, and, and did it uh, with flying colors. Uh, but that's only the tip of the iceberg, those deployments. Um, there, as Genevieve will know, and I'm sure General Campbell will know, whenever you're getting ready to go, the deployment is actually the short part of it. You're spending months and months on courses and in the field and on exercise away from home. Um, the, the, the actual cycle to go is actually 18 months long, 12 months of training, intense training, where you're gone for long periods of that time, and then the six-month deployment afterwards. So that's a huge burden to bear. And those, those are, again, you're away from your, your family, um, not there to support them, not there to work through that. And then there's postings. I was posted 25 times, or sorry, 12 times in 25 years. Uh, my wife, once uh, she started taking part in that journey with me, uh, went through six postings. My daughters, uh, as you mentioned, uh, thankfully, they never had to live through where I was operationally deployed. But by the time they were in grade four, they were starting their fourth school. Um, so all of those things take a toll. And there's a degree of sacrifice. And I'm sure uh, General Campbell and Sergeant Goche will both uh, echo this because my story is not unique. It, it's, a, it's a pattern that all of us would share. 
and all of our colleagues would share that, that we've all lived this experience. Um, the sacrifices that the families make is incredible. Um, and I think it, it, it does deserve to be noted. It needs to be noted in that awareness uh, through the public, uh, the supports that we offer the families, um, uh, both from public and, and non-public uh, sort of supports and, and uh, cultural supports. And I think there's scope for things to recognize it within the commemoration programs as well. And I think it's very important. Th thanks very much for the question. Well, no, and, and thank you for the response. And, and certainly, I know your, your colleagues would love to weigh in, though I know that we are nearing the end of our time together. But I think your, your response has reinforced the need to, that families have to be an important part of this conversation as we look forward to this approach to commemoration and to the future. Et certainement, l'expérience comme mère pour Sergent Gauthier, comme père, comme époux, aussi épouse, pour le Lieutenant Général Campbell aussi, font partie. Euh, des discussions à venir. Euh, mais malheureusement, c'est tout le temps que nous disposons aujourd'hui. Moi, j'ai appris énormément, puis euh, je sais que vous aviez partagé, comme que j'ai dit tantôt, de, du fond de vos cœurs, les expériences que vous aviez partagées et vraiment de la façon pour euh, laquelle que vous aimeriez être connu. Euh, c'est des informations importantes qu'on qu continue de développer l'approche, puis c'est vraiment juste le début des discussions. Donc, je vous tiens à vous remercier, lieutenant général Campbell, le lieutenant colonel Hutt et la sergente Gauthier, de nous avoir généreusement fait part de vos idées, vos opinions intéressantes aujourd'hui. Vous nous avez donné beaucoup de matière à réflexion. I once read that a hero is someone who has given his or her life to something bigger than oneself. You all proudly and bravely wore the Canadian flag on your uniforms for so many years while giving so much of yourselves. You are truly heroes and my deepest gratitude for your service. And to the veterans and everyone else watching this session online, if you'd like to share your own thoughts on how Canada should commemorate newer generations of service members, we do want to know. We will be commencing consultation shortly, but please register at letstalkveterans.ca and let your voices be heard. I encourage our viewers as well to keep an eye open for our next Veterans Affairs Canada panel for further exploration of important themes surrounding remembrance in our country. Stay tuned on all of our channels with Veterans Affairs Canada to find out more. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup.